Hello, Table Family. How are we doing tonight? That's what I'm talking about. Hey, listen, I appreciate the energy. I know people are excited about this topic, but I want to just, I just want to start on something. I want to pick up what Lucas was putting down, right? Uh, uh, it's October. We were just having this conversation with some of our teams. It's October. This is when it starts getting colder in Florida. You know, it hits 75 instead of 78. All the girls come in with like, you know, like the thick coats on and their scarves and they're just like pumpkin spice season, right? Uh, but something else happens in October. It's when we hit that wall, like all of the good energy you had for the semester. You're like, yeah, I'm going to make A's. And then you hit October and you're like, a B really is okay, right? Uh, your work projects, like it's a start of a, the last quarter and you're like, oh my gosh, we've got to finish these projects this quarter, right? I'm not going to make my bonus. Like, it, it's just the season when everybody gets a little bit discouraged, if I can talk about that. And, and I, I love that Lucas uh, pastored us through that moment to begin because uh, my sense is that a lot of us here today are very, uh, we're discouraged, especially if you work for Disney and you just got a call last week, you're probably here today and you're a little bit discouraged. And so I want to say right up front, the thing we're going to talk about here this evening is an idea of encouragement, but I want to just, I want to spill the beans up front. Um, the encouragement that we're going to try to find in this world, if we're going to be Christians, if we're going to follow Christianity uh, at, at any uh, rate, is not going to be found. The encouragement is not going to be found in the political process. The encouragement we are going to look for is going to be found in Jesus. This is the main thing I'm going to say today. If you only get one thing, just understand the encouragement that all of us need, especially when we're discouraged, is not found in the political process. It's found in Jesus. He's the way maker. He's the miracle worker. He's the promise keeper. He's the light in the darkness. He's the one who says when it seems like there's no way forward, he says there is a way forward because that's who Jesus is. And if the Bible is true, and it is, you know, what it says about Jesus is he's the one who will make a way in our lives when it seems that we are discouraged and without hope. And so I want to say that right up front because we're going to talk about a subject here today that uh, unfortunately tries to usurp this idea of hope and apply it to politics. And I want to set everything up before we get going with just my experience on the political process, okay? So if you don't know me, if this is your first time, or if this is your first time in a long time, my name's Doug. I give leadership to the table around here. But before I gave leadership to the table around here, uh, I was once a kid who grew up in a non-Christian, probably atheist family, uh, maybe agnostic family, and I didn't know anything about religion at all. Like, I didn't know anything about religion. Like, I can't stress this enough. I didn't know anything about organized religion, especially not Christianity. I wouldn't be caught dead in a church, not at my own funeral, right? That's just not the family I grew up in. But one of the things we had growing up was politics because my dad uh, was the chair of the Democratic Party in the county that I grew up in. My dad's a lawyer. He's very much passionate about politics. And we grew up campaigning for Democrats. I remember in 1992, before most of y'all were born, because I'm really old, uh, I turn 39 tomorrow, happy birthday to me, uh, right? Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Jesus, for one more year. Uh, thank you, it's not 40, because uh, then, then I'm really old. Uh, so I, in 92, I remember campaigning for Clinton. We were planting uh, signs. This is Bill Clinton, not Hillary Clinton, right? Uh, we're planting signs out there. He's the Democratic uh, nominee from Arkansas, and we were just like, yay, Clinton, yay, Clinton, yay, Clinton. And I remember it was the first time I had ever kind of been aware of these two terms. I, like, Clinton was the candidate that everyone was supposed to get around, and I just thought, okay, as people of reason, we're just going to go for Clinton because that's what my dad told me. And there was, there was this person who said, yeah, but, but Clinton's a Democrat. And I went, oh, aren't, aren't we all Democrats? And he was like, no, no, bud, there's Republicans. And I was like, what are Republicans? Like, it was like this, you know, uh, it was like a, a, a young man who doesn't have commitment issues, right, ladies, uh, right? It was like this white way, I'm kidding, guys, I love you, right? Uh, they were like, you're like, dang, Doug, I'm discouraged. Why are you hitting those shots across the bow? Jeez, settle down. Put the guns back in your pocket. Anyway, uh, uh they were like the white whale. I'd never heard of them before. I didn't know what Republicans were, right? And I was like, wait, what are Republicans? And so I remember, I'm uh, 11 at the time. I'm like, I, I must find out who Republicans are. 
And so in my little hometown, a small town in East Texas, I, uh, I start going around. I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm very curious. I start doing some surveys. I'm like, uh, hey, like when you think about politics, we, we had one of those things. You guys remember this, like third, fourth grade? It was like, we're going to have a fake election because it was an election year. And so like you, you, everybody voted and then you tallied and looked at the results and like your teacher reported to CNN, hey, you know, Mrs. Thomas's fourth grade class says that Clinton is going to win, right? And somehow that, that swung the balance. So I just remember there was like the Republican candidate. So I'm asking all my classmates like, hey, like what do you vote for? And the first thing I learned in my hometown is that people who wore camouflage and loved guns, they voted for Republicans, right? That, that's it. I would just see my friends, and I'd be like, uh, hey, Billy Joe, like, uh, who are you voting for? And he's like, well, we're going to vote for the Republican candidate. And I was like, okay, Republicans are gods and God and guns. Like, that's it. Christians who love to own guns, they vote for Republicans. So I, like, took notes in my journals. I was like, okay, so in, in order to vote Republican, I have to be a Christian and I have to own a gun. I, I was neither at that time at 11, 12. So I was like, okay, cool. I guess I'm a Democrat. Like, I, I don't know, right? Well, when I turned 16, I got saved and I became a Christian. Just God did some amazing work in my life and I, I believed in Jesus and I said, man, it seems like I ought to follow you, Jesus, in my life. And so I remember going over to people's houses in my church and a lot of their houses were like, these were houses of doctors and lawyers and bankers and financial planning people. And I remember we got on the subject of politics. And so I just said, hey, uh, like, what do you like, what, what do you think about politics? Is it Democrat? Is it Republican? Like, I just, you know, I don't see any guns in your room and there's no camo. Like, you have a white collar. You don't have a camo collar. Like, what do you think? And these doctors, these uh, lawyers and all that, they just said, well, you know, we vote Republican. And I was like, oh, tax breaks. Got it. Because you guys have a lot of money. And so y'all want to keep that. So I just wrote like, okay, the three conditions under which you vote Republican, you're a Christian who owns guns and you're a white collar worker and you want the tax breaks. And so I just kind of said to them, I was like, well, you know, I'm not wealthy and I don't own guns. Like, can I vote Republican? And they were like, well, as a Christian, you should vote Republican. And I was like, oh, I should? Like, it's a moral imperative? They're like, yes, sir, you should vote Republican. It's like, oh, boy, I got I to gotta make a decision in two years in the next election because I, I grew up Democrat, but now I'm a Christian now. I guess I have to vote Republican. Like, I just, I was unaware that that was in the Bible. And so I just, you know, I just thought, okay, but, you know, I trusted these people. Fast forward, I get to, I turn 18, it's the first election, 2000, uh, George W. Bush, that whole thing, he's from Waco, Texas, I'm in school in Waco, Texas, and I'm like, man, you know, I live in Waco, Texas, I'm a Christian, I feel like I should vote Republican, but I just, I was confused, so I, I found some of my friends at school, um, some of my friends who are Hispanic from Mexico, and I said, hey, you guys are, are Mexican-Americans, like, you know, I've only kind of talked to mainly white people, like kind of rednecks and some white-collar white people, but like, y'all are, y'all are not particularly white people, you're kind of Mexican, like Latin American, like, what do you guys think about this whole politics thing? And they were like, we vote Republican. And I was like, really? And he was like, yes. I was like, well, but what about immigration? And they're like, yes, we don't want any more immigrants coming in because we got here. This is a true story. Because we got here, like we climbed up on the ladder and we kicked the ladder down. And we're like, we don't want any more immigrants coming because we don't want them taking. It's a zero sum game and we're here. We need to keep all the resources. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is, I am so confused. Like, so you have, you have rednecks and doctors, country club people. So rednecks, country club people, and now second generation Mexican Americans who are here and who are ambitious, they're voting Republican. And I was like, okay, I guess I got to vote Republican. Fast forward eight years. I'm living in Chicago. It's 2008. Barack Obama gets elected president from Chicago. I am a member of the Black and Latino Student Association in my grad school, and we have a meeting the day of the election or the day after the election, and I show up to this meeting, and all of my friends come in. They're all African-American, and they're all Latino, and they show up, and they are all like hungover. Not really hungover from alcohol, but although I'm, I wouldn't doubt that too, but I think they're hungover because they were in Grant Park in Chicago, and Obama had the victory speech with Michelle, and they did the whole thing, and they took the trains back, and so we're talking. I'm like, Man, what did you guys think about that? And they said, man, it was incredible. It was like this glass ceiling was shattered. And now as a black man, as a person of color, I, I feel like I can do anything in this world. There's no limitations to this. And I was like, oh, that's so incredible. So I'm just asking them, like, like, you're a Christian, right? They're like, yeah. I was like, so did you vote Republican? And they're like, Psh, no, I didn't vote Republican. I voted for Obama, man. And I was like, wait, you can be a Christian and a Democrat? And they were like, yes. And I was like, Brrr. and so I was like, okay, I don't know anything anymore. Like I, at this point I thought, okay, 
in the Christian world, it was only Republican. But now there's this whole new category. You can be a Christian and vote Democrat. And the conditions under which you can be a Christian and vote Democrat is that you're black or you're Latin American who's not a second generation uh, Mexican immigrant who wants to kick the ladder out from all the other people coming across. That's the Democrats. And then over here, it's the rednecks and it's the country club people and it's the second generation immigrants who want to kick the ladder out from everybody else. Okay, cool. So these are my two options if I'm a Christian and I just got to figure out where I'm more aligned with. After grad school, I moved back to Waco, Texas. Outside of Waco, Texas, there is an Anabaptist community. Does anyone know what Anabaptist communities are? Anybody grew up in an Anabaptist or like an Amish community? Anybody from Pennsylvania? You know some Amish people, right? Okay. Oh, we got one in the back. There you go, Amish people. Uh, Some of you are like, Amish people don't raise their hands, Doug. Uh, So I met the, this, this Amish community, this Anabaptist community. Some people call it a cult, right? They had this alternative community outside of the city. And I went to go meet with them. And I was hanging out. And I was like, hey, guys, I'm just curious. How do you guys vote? Is it, do you tend to align Republican? Do you tend to align Democrat? Like, how do you do this? And they said the darndest thing to me. You know what they said? They said, we don't participate in voting because it's a moral sin. And I went, what? There's another option? And they're like, yeah, there's a whole bunch of options. I was like, I don't understand what it means to be a Christian anymore. Like, I'm completely confused on what it means to be a Christian, specifically as it relates to this issue of politics and policy uh, and position statements and political parties. I don't know how Christianity informs that because it seems like there's a lot of diversity out there. Well, maybe you're here today and you have that same confusion. You don't know how Christianity might inform the political process, or maybe like our Anabaptist friends, you're not so sure that that Christianity should should permit you to even engage in the political process at all. And what I want to do tonight is just look at a couple of verses of Scripture to try to just frame the issue a little bit on what the Bible might say to us as we consider thinking about politics in about a month. Voting Republican, voting Democrat, voting third party, or just not voting at all because you think it's a moral sin. And so if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open to Psalm 20. Psalm 20. There's an important verse that we're going to look at here. Psalm 20. If you don't have your Bibles, that's okay. You can Google search it on your phone or you can look at it on the screen. Now, uh, as you guys are opening, I want to just review the quadrant that we've, we've done thus far. So we've been using this quadrant as a, as a lens for us to think about all matter of issues, uh, alcohol, sexuality. Next week, we're looking at toxic friends. In a couple of, week, a couple of weeks, we're looking at social justice issues. Uh, but this is the framework we're thinking about. Remember, Jesus said this, I'm sending you into the world as sheep among wolves. I want you to be wise, or I want you to be as Um, innocent as doves. I want you to be as shrewd as serpents. And you've got to be both. You've got to be both morally innocent, but also you've got to understand how the breaks of the game work, and you've got to play chess, not checkers. If you're only someone who is innocent without considering the benefit of the pragmatics, you're someone who is naive. And a lot of us grew up in that world where we just consider morality, we don't consider the practicals, and we're just this naive person growing up in a Christian bubble. On the other hand, the other extreme there is if we think about only the calculated benefit, but we don't consider the morality of the subject, if we think about only its effectiveness, but not also its, its moral obedience, then that makes us someone who's pretty calculating and schmarmy, and people don't want to be around calculated, schmarmy people. If we don't consider anything, neither the morality nor the effectiveness of it, that's when we end up hopeless in the world. But if we can do both things, if we can consider the moral framework, if we can consider the effectiveness of it, then we can operate with confidence in the way that we make decisions. Today, I want to look at scripture and begin to fill out this framework as it relates to politics. And so to do so, I'm going to look at Psalm chapter 20, verses 7 and 8. And here's what it says. Some trust in chariots and some in horses. But we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They collapse and fall, but we rise and stand upright. David is writing the psalm. Maybe you've heard it before. Some people are trusting in chariots. Other people are trusting in their horses. But we're going to trust in the name of the Lord our God. 
If we remixed this and rethought about the way that David writes this, he would say this. He would say, some people put their hope in chariots. Some people put their hope in these horses, but we're going to put our hope in God. We're not hoping in horses or chariots. We're hoping in God. People who hope in horses and chariots, they, they fall. People who hope in God, they're the people who are victorious, who walk in confidence. What in the world does this have to do with politics? Well, on one level, David is trying to help us understand this distinction here that, that really it, it's kind of two separate categories. It's these things that exist on earth that are readily available and understood that come up over and over again in every culture we might live in, kind of the horse and the chariot kind of um, example there. And this pops up from time to time in every culture, y'all. On the other hand, he said, compared and contrast to that, we have the Lord. And it seems that in life, we're kind of given these two binary options. We can hope in these created things, these these human things, these uh, things that exist on earth, or we can hope in God. And here's the secret to life. If you hope in things created, things on earth, you're going to be disappointed. It's true. But if you can hope in God, if you can rest, make sure that your trust, make sure that your expectation is on God and what he's going to do, then you are going to have a confident, successful life uh, of what we would consider to be blessing. But let me make the case here that I think David is specifically talking about things very much related to the political realm. So don't you notice the two terms he uses there, horses and chariots. So let me define these for us. Number one, a horse. A horse is a beast that runs the race. A horse is a beast that runs a race. Have you ever heard in a political season candidates referred to as horses or described in such a way that it sounds a lot like a horse race? Think about this. If you turn on Fox News or CNN or wherever you get your polls or what your data or whatever, you get on Twitter, you get on Instagram, whatever, right? You're going to see something like this. Well, we just took a poll. Biden is leading in this race for the presidency. Trump is trailing at 19 points behind him. What are the commentators doing? They're describing a political race as a horse race. Biden's in the lead. Can Trump close? Biden just outspent uh, Trump two to one. Can Trump close the distance? They are describing a political uh, candidacy in terms of a horse race. In fact, political operatives will often refer to their candidates as a horse in a race. I'm backing this horse. You're backing this horse. And what David is saying to us applies perfectly in this case. Listen, some people trust in candidates. Some people put their hope in candidates, and he's saying, don't do that because you're going to stumble. Why? Well, on, uh, if we uh, lay this over on the little grid here, you're going to find this. People who uh, put their hope in candidates are people that often end up being incredibly naive. Hoping in a candidate, hoping in a candidate is an incredibly naive way, uh, way to think about politics for this reason. Typically, when we put our hope in candidates, we're putting hope in their moral value or the moral value they're going to bring to the table. Obama made this very popular in 2008. In fact, his whole campaign was built on hope, right? Hope and change. Obama is this figure. Remember, it was the like red, white, blue kind of uh, comic book kind of view of Obama. He's like this, right? Looking all amazing. And then it had like hope down there. And then the O was his Obama uh, like an icon there. It was brilliant. Uh, my buddy Caleb was on uh, Obama's campaign. He was a social media manager. And um, the first time he sent me that thing, I was just like, this is incredible. Like whoever your graphic design person needs a, a race. Like that's amazing. But what Obama's trying to do is go, hope in me. Why? Because I'll bring about this moral vision of the future that you want to happen. And the way that argument goes is this, and you guys have heard this. Hey, if you vote for Obama, he's going to make everything perfect. Hey, if you vote for Trump, he's going to make everything perfect. Hey, if you vote for Biden, he's going to make everything perfect. Hey, if you vote for Hillary, I'm with her, she's going to make everything perfect. If you vote for Clinton, I said this in 92. Hey, if you vote for Clinton, it was almost like, do you guys remember Napoleon Dynamite? Are you all old enough to remember this? Right? Vote for me and I will make all your wildest dreams come true. Right? This is every political candidate. It's Pedro and Napoleon Dynamite. Vote for me and everything will, everything will magically get better. And it's just an incredibly naive way of thinking about politics. You guys will see this on Facebook. I'm voting for Trump because he's really tough on 
businesses and he's really tough on the government. He's going to drain the swamp and he's going to give us our guns back and he's going to end abortion and he's going to give us all money and he's going to create rainbows that come out of his eyes. The reason he got COVID is because he wants rainbows to come out of his eyes, right? Just this kind of messianic view of the candidate and it's like, oh, all my hope is in this person. Hey, listen, some people trust in horses. Those people will be disappointed. We can't put our hope in a candidate. On the other hand, there's the chariot. And here's the way the chariot's defined. A chariot is the machine that helps the driver win the race. It's something that has been constructed. It's a well-oiled machine. It has moving parts. And it moves you from point A to point B in the most expedient way possible. This is a chariot. This is a machine. And oftentimes you hear politics talked about as a political machine. Okay, it doesn't matter who the candidate is. The GOP has this great party, and it's going to push that candidate through. It doesn't matter who the candidate is. The, De- the Democratic Party has a machine. It has policy. It has procedure, and it's just going to push everybody through. And you'll hear people just say, trust the process. Blindly trust the process. Just vote straight ticket because we're going to do everything. right. Just trust us. We've been doing politics for a long time. We know how to get somebody in the White House. We know how to get the Supreme Court picks on there. We know how to get our Congress people in there. We're going to control all three branches. And man, when we just do this, then we're just going to push all our legislative agenda through. And you're going to get more money and lower taxes. And everyone's going to be happier. And no one's going to be marginalized. And Just trust the process. Just blindly trust the process. As if human process ever has consistently produced the outcomes it claims to produce. This is shrewdness without a sense of morality, if you see it up here. Hope in the political machine. And let me just tell you, as someone who has voted for now 20 years, I don't know, man. I just don't know that voting for one particular party or another necessarily always produces happy results. If that was the case, it seems like the world would be a lot better now. And it it seems to me that the world's just the same, if not a little bit worse. And so I don't know that you can trust in a chariot either. And what the Bible says is don't trust in that machine. It's going to let you down. Now, the third thing here that's up there is the same thing, which is I don't trust in machine and I don't trust in the political candidate. I just don't consider either of those things. And what happens to me? I end up politically hopeless. You might know somebody who used to be Republican, but they don't like Trump now, and they're never going to vote Democrat. And when they get on social media, they're just like, this is, October has been the longest year ever. And they're just like, I'm so despondent. And they, everyone seems to talk like Eeyore on social media. Do you guys get that? Like, no matter how they read it, it's just like, I don't know. The weather is sunny, uh, sunny and 75 today in Orlando, right? It's just everything is just so miserable. Those are hopeless people, people who have no hope in the candidate, and they have no hope in the process, and they don't know that there's a fourth option. And David tells us there's a fourth option here. Some trust in horses, some trust in chariots, but we trust, we put our hope in the name of the Lord our God. They collapse and fall but we rise and stand upright. Guys, what I want us to do today is not really any kind of call to action other than it's a call to think correctly about things. I think if we can just think correctly about politics, it's going to cover over a multitude of sins. And here's the big idea. When it comes to politics, put your hope in Jesus. Because guess what? Jesus is the same yesterday And today and tomorrow, he created everything. He's going to bring everything to consummation. He is going to sustain us. He is going to intercede for each of us at the right hand of the Father. He has created us in the Father's image. He has given us inherent dignity. It doesn't matter if we're black or white or Hispanic. It doesn't matter if we vote Republican. It doesn't matter if we vote Democrat. It doesn't matter if we don't vote at all. It doesn't matter if we're politically apathetic. It doesn't matter. He loves us and pursues us and gives us a hope and a future. And that's never going to change no matter who's in the White House or who's on the Supreme Court bench or who's in the congressional offices, it doesn't matter. Jesus is the same. And if we put our hope in him, then there's no more hope for us to put in the political process. It frees us up to think about politics primarily in terms of morality and pragmatics the same. It's a life management issue. When I go to the polls, when I go to a community meeting, 
when I go out to hand out flyers for a certain political thing, when I sign up to help people vote, when I go to a community protest or a community rally, I'm not doing that thinking it's really going to change anything in eternity. It's really going to make a difference. I just am aware it's part of a political process. It's a necessary pragmatic step I've got to take forward because I believe in the morality of this or I don't believe in the morality of something else. But at the end of the day, when I go home and I put my feet up, I can rest assured knowing that I've done enough and my work is good because I'm not ultimately working for a political machine. I am doing everything in my life to be about Jesus and his kingdom advancing, and there's nothing that politics can ever do to overthrow that. That is most important in my life, so everything else doesn't have to be. So that when my friends on Facebook are knuckleheads and they post stupid stuff about politics, I don't have to get mad at them. I'm just like, ah, I probably wouldn't have posted that. But I don't have to get on there and be like, I can't believe you posted that. Haven't you read this verse here? Jesus didn't write in on an elephant. He wrote in on a donkey. Vote Democrat. Boom. Right? I don't have to to get salty on social media. Why? Because my hope isn't in politics. You want to tell me I'm a stupid so-and-so for voting A instead of B? Okay, I might be. But my hope and my identity is not in politics. It's in Jesus. And Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And you know what? As long as I'm in Jesus... It doesn't really matter what happens in November because that doesn't change his agenda and his plan. He's going to move forward resolute and not be slowed down by any of our silly political processes or our silly political candidates as important as they may be to our practical living. If you don't believe me, I want to show you a verse in the Old Testament or a chapter in the Old Testament. Can we just, can we, can we play Bible, you know, whatever, what's the thing called? Bible drill. Can we do Bible drill here? Sorry, I didn't grow up in Christianity, so uh, I don't know that term. If you got Bibles and you're just curious, flip on over to Daniel chapter 6. I want to read you the story of Daniel. If you don't know anything about Daniel, Daniel's this Old Testament guy, and uh, he's living in Bible times. I'm sorry, we can't print anything anymore, and so I have to like, oh, there we go. I have to use this because, you know, the environment and trees and stuff. Y'all are like, he votes Republican. Uh, Daniel chapter 6. Daniel in the lion's den, if you ever heard this. There's a guy named Daniel. He's in this kingdom. There's a king named Darius. Daniel is actually an, not an elected official, but an appointed official in this kingdom. There's 120 appointed officials called satraps. Daniel's one of them, but Daniel is a Hebrew. He follows God. He puts his hope in God. And the other 119, they put their hope in the king, or they put their hope in their own political ambitions. And... Um, Here's what it says. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom. And over them three high officials of whom Daniel was one. So of the 120, Daniel is like a supervisor. Maybe he's like a governor. He's something like that. But there are other governors and other political officials. So this is a very political environment. To uh, To whom these satraps would give account, this would be Daniel. So that the king might suffer no loss. Then... This Daniel became distinguished above them all, uh, over all the other high officials and satraps, because an excellent spirit was on him. In other words, he had consistent, confident character in who God was. And because God doesn't change, Daniel's character didn't change, because his hope was in God, and so he was able to be consistent in all that he did. Verse 5, then, um, I'm sorry, verse 4, then the high officials and the satraps sought to find ground for a complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could not find ground for, or any complaint for fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. Then these men said, we shall not find any ground for complaint against Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of God. Now let me summarize what happens next. These 119 satraps, these officials, they say, okay, here's what we're going to do, all right? There's like a little seedy back room kind of deal, cigar smoke, right? If any of you know politics, it's kind of like Tammany Hall in New York in the 1900s. Anybody else? History majors? Just me? Okay, cool. Uh, so they're back and they're making a back, rooms deal, a back room deal and they say, here's what we're going to do. We're going to create a law that nobody can worship any other God except for the king as God. 
And once Darius has had like four drinks of alcohol, he's had like two shots of Jameson, and then he's in on his third bottle of wine. We're going to come up when he's good and real nice. Uh, We're going to come up and we're going to slide this law across his desk, and he's going to be like, sure, and he'll sign it. And then we now have this political machine, this chariot that's going to capture Daniel, and we're going to be able to to, to kick him out, and we're going to be able to exercise our political agenda, and we got him, and the king's on our side. Ha, 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 ha. Psh, 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 right? I, I imagine it's nefarious like that. Anyway, so they do that, and they slide it to the king, and the king signs it, and then the next day, this is what it says. It's really interesting. Daniel's response in verse 10 says this, when Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open towards Jerusalem. And he got down on his knees three times a day, and he prayed, and he gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. So this is Daniel's response. The law in the land is against me. The political rulers in the land are against me. The king of the land is now against me. What am I going to do? Well, let me just adjust what I believe so I can be with the, the majority here. Let me, nope. Well, let me just freak out and just be like, oh, let me get on social media. Everything is the worst. Nope. He said, you know what? My hope is in God. And so I'm going to pray to him and have fellowship with him. And as long as I got him, it really doesn't matter what happens because I know in the end God wins. And this might be a little bit hairy for me in a little bit, but you know what? I know God wins. My hope is not in chariots or in horses. It's in the name of God, and I'm going to focus on him. So everything else, it matters, but it doesn't matter. Well, what happens is these men came in, they knew he was praying, and they catch him, and they're like, gotcha. And they, they take a photo, they post it to social media, they're like, look at this guy praying to somebody. Oh, look, there's a shawl next to him. He's Jewish. He's probably praying to Yahweh. Now we got him. They take him into the king. They're like, hey, remember when you signed that law when you were drunk at like four in the morning after closing time? Remember when you did that? It was totally legal. Don't ask any questions. But remember when you signed that law? Yeah, well, Daniel was praying to Yahweh, not to you. And so now you got to lay down the boom, son, and you got to throw him out. And the king is bewildered. And he goes, man, I don't know what I got to do. Like on the one hand, this is law. If I don't back my own law, I look foolish and I lose face. But this is Daniel. He's my best guy and he's so honorable. I know he didn't do anything wrong. I know those guys tricked me and I know they tricked him, but the law is the law. And so he moves into the political process. He takes Daniel and he throws him in the lion's den. Now, anybody work at Animal Kingdom? Anybody work around lions? Okay. Uh, anybody, right? Uh, I don't know where uh, Lydia is from Wild Kingdom, right? Thomas. Lions. Okay, there we go. Lydia. Lions, if they don't eat and there's like maybe a human or an animal there, they'll eat the animal, right? Yeah. You don't want, you didn't hear that. You don't want to be around some hungry lions, right? Like, not at all, Lydia? Yeah, not at all, right? And Lydia knows because she's basically like keeper of the lions and the reptiles. Uh, that's what she does. That's how she gets down. Shout out to Lydia. Uh, so they throw them in and the, the lions are hungry. And you would think at this moment, well, the political machine worked towards its end. See, we set up this process. We got the Supreme Court nominees on there. Boom. And then we got the congressional people. Boom. We got the president. We got the law on our side. And this is so nice. And now it's going to move towards its conclusion. Nope. Why? Because they were trusting in chariots and they were trusting in horses. Daniel was trusting in God. And so what God did is he put an angel in their midst, a supernatural manifestation of his own presence there. And he went to every lion and he went, shut your mouth and shut your mouth and shut your mouth and shut your mouth and shut your mouth. It's kind of what we want to do on on Facebook sometimes. Oh, talking about politics, shut your mouth, muted, unfriended, uh, unfollowed. I got to be strategic. Okay, right? Uh, Because they're like, ah, they'll never know I unfollow them, Uh, right? And that's what he did. So lions all shut their mouth. And when the king went in the next morning, he opened up the hatch and he looked in and was like, Daniel, are you still alive? And he's like, yeah, man, you know, it's, uh, it's like 68 degrees in here. I got a nice Snuggie. Uh, these lions are super fun hangs. Uh, so like, thanks for that. And he's like, oh, so you're alive? He's like, yeah, my God protected me. He sent an angel in here and shut the lion's mouth. And it's been really cool. And so the king pulls Daniel out and goes, this is incredible. I'm so glad that God did this. He is the real God. Then he went and took all the officials who got him drunk and made him sign the document, and he threw them into the lions. 
And let's just say God did not send an angel in there to shut his mouth. It was like someone going on Facebook and like, you know, uh, like the most democratic uh, a group on Facebook and just posting a MAGA sign. And it was just like, ah, right? Just like they just took them out. Like it was just incredible. And they were gone. But then this thing happens. It's really incredible. The king has this moment where he says something to Daniel. The very end. Verse 25, then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell on earth. Here's what he wrote. Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, people are to tremble in fear before the God of Daniel. What did the king come to realize? I'm not going to hope in horses or in chariots. I'm going to hope in whoever God Daniel's God is because that dude seems to be the real deal. And then he says this, for he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. What is this human king who has dominion and power saying? He's saying, I recognize even in all of my might and strength, it is nothing compared to the God of Daniel. In other words, I'm not going to trust in horses or in chariots. Even I, as a pagan king, I'm going to trust in the name of God. Why? Because that is going to endure forever. It's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And so in light of this, I want to invite us to make four kinds of shifts in our thinking, in the way that we think about, in the way that we talk about, in the way that we interact on social media, in the way that we interact with our friends, okay? Four shifts in our thinking, and they're spelled out positively. They'll be on your screen. Here they are. Number one, how might I hope in Jesus and try this approach to politics? Number one, we've got to shift to realize the only perfect politician is Jesus. The only perfect politician is Jesus. Everybody else falls short of that. When you go to the ballot, you can't vote for Jesus. You can write him in, but you can't vote for him. I'm not saying I have or I haven't or that I even vote. I'm just saying <laughs> that you can't. And so here's what this means. If I'm voting for Trump in November, he's not perfect, and he's not the savior, and he's not great for America or bad for America. He is a flawed human candidate who stands for certain things. And when I vote for Biden, he's not perfect. He's not the savior of America. Uh, he's a flawed human being who has some policies and, and things he's organizing around. And so either vote for them is not a vote for Jesus. And so my hope is going to be in Jesus, not in this candidate I vote for. Until we can vote for Jesus, there is no perfect political candidate. Right. Number two, we need to make this shift. The only perfect policy is in the kingdom. The only perfect policy, the only flawless, meticulously crafted law that's ever been exacted uh, or political process, the only way that works, it, it's in the kingdom. The only policy that works from beginning to middle to end is in the kingdom. The only reign or rule that works perfectly, consistently in all cultures at all times for all people and is super inclusive and super uh, uh, unifying and super uh, perfect for everybody, it's in the kingdom. And so if we're thinking about policy on earth, it's going to be incredibly flawed and we have to be okay with it. Why? Because my hope's not in this policy. It's the best thing I can think of today, but tomorrow it will probably be uh, terrible and I'm okay with that. We're going to try to get through today, see if it can help us today, and then we'll get to tomorrow. I remember when Obamacare was coming out, uh, I had friends on that side, and they were like, man, Obama, Obamacare is finally going to solve all the ills and the medical problems people have in America. I'm like, man, listen, no, it's not. It's really not, because it's not in the kingdom, and so it's going to be flawed, and, and I think it would be much better to just go, listen, it's flawed but it may work a little bit better than what's been there before, but it's still flawed because that's the most honest thing you can say. Anytime a political candidate comes out and goes, well, I got this new deal, and in the next five years, you know, I'm just going to make glitter fall from heaven for everybody, right? I'm just like, no, you're not. It might fall in Seattle, but that's just a rain issue, right? There's just, there's no way you're going to be able to do that. Just be honest with us. It's not heaven. It's on earth, bro. And so it's the best you can do is this flawed political policy. That's the second shift. Third is this. The only perfect party is thrown by God. <laughs> I 
Uh, I remember I had this one lady who was head of the um, Republicans in, in my hometown, the head of the Republican Party, and she was like, hey, would you like to join the Republican Party? And I was like, cool, what games do you have? Uh, and she was like, well, no, 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 there's no games. I was like, okay, cool, like, what do you do? She's like, well, we get together, and then we talk about our favorite uh, policies and our favorite Republican presidents, and then we talk about how we're going get, to get out to help people vote, and da, 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 da. And I was like, that sounds like the worst party I've ever been to in my life. Like, what's your food spread like? And she's like, well, you know, we have Triscuits and we have ranch. And I'm like, pass. Uh, like, that sounds terrible. Uh, same is true for the Democratic Party, right? Uh, Democratic Party, typically that party has better music, uh, I think. Uh, but I mean, it's, again, even the independent third candidate party, listen, it's just not going to be as good as heaven, okay? The only party I really want to be part of is the heaven party because that music is dope, right? And the king of that party is Jesus, and that dude is dope. And the people there, it's all of us. There's Democrats, uh, Democrats and Republicans and Independent and the Amish friends who don't vote. They're all going to be there before Jesus, and that party is going to be amazing. That's the only party I want to be a part of. And so, listen, you may go, I feel strongly about Republican or about Democrat or whatever, and you want to be part of that party? Great. Just admit, it's a second-class party to heaven, right? And that's the one we really want everybody to be a part of as believers. Because we're not going to trust in horses and chariots. Our hope is in Jesus. And finally, the fourth shift. The only perfect process is the one governed by the Spirit. Beginning, middle, end. I hear my friends say this all the time. Uh, it started in the 1970s with the moral majority. Like, okay, listen, if we can get a Republican president and we can get a Republican Supreme Court or a conservative Supreme Court that are, you know, strict textualists, that don't read anything into the Constitution, if we can get Republican lawmakers, then we can appeal Roe versus Wade. And I'm like, I don't think that's true, <laughs> right? Because that implies that everything has to go right to do that. And man, I think abortion is wrong. I'm just going to say that up front. I, think, uh, I, I do think it's probably murdering babies. I think it's wrong. And so we have to talk about it in terms of murder. If you're someone who's here today and you've had an abortion, I don't mean to put shame on you or anything. But I just think from the outset, that is something that is wrong. I understand why we have all these provisions medically and all these other things. But to think that if we just get this guy and get this girl and this thing and we, do, and we, do, and we know, jiggle the handle on the toilet and we lean over and stick our tongue and, it's just, and we get the antenna on the TV and, you know, we turn around three times and spit, right? If we just do all these things and that process is going to produce this out, it's not going to produce the outcome. Because until the Holy Spirit is moving, the best we can do is operate within a broken process. And again, I'm not saying that all of us shouldn't trust any processes or we shouldn't uh, consider the, the value or the merit of voting for a candidate or consider certain policies or join parties or be part of things. Some of you are very passionate about all these things, but listen, it's all second rate compared to Jesus because he's the only thing that's going to be the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And so with that, I want to invite you, I just want to pray for us. I want to pray for our nation. And then Lucas is going to sing a song. He's going to sing a song, All My Hope Is In Jesus. I thought that was a fitting uh, end up here as we think and meditate on this. But I want to ask, invite you to, uh, to join in praying with me. Jesus, we recognize our hope is in you. And so therefore, we don't have to put our hope in this political process. Lord Jesus, we've got tons of candidates running for offices, and it's super important where they are for their communities. Lord, we pray for Trump and for his campaign and just for his healing from COVID and Melania and all the other people who've got COVID. We pray for their healing of that. We pray also for Biden and for his candidacy and for what he's trying to do. And we pray for all the local people, the mayors and the, you know, assistant superintendent of the school district and all the important local things and the state things and the regional things. Lord, these are these are all things that have their place in our fallen, broken community. And Lord, we just, as Romans 13 challenges us to do, as Paul does, just pray for our elected officials. Lord, bless them, keep them healthy, help them to speak clearly and with conviction, help them to clearly articulate the differences in their position from the other guy or the other girls. But Jesus, at the end of the day, may we not take our eyes off of that which really matters. You 
and your kingdom and your plan and your ability to truly save us from what ails us. So Lord, all our hope is in you. And we're going to sing that together now. It's in your name we pray. Amen.